Good morning. It's Miss Pam from the Andes Public Library and welcome to our story time. It's Wednesday, September 9th, I think, 2020. And if you haven't started school or if you have started school, this might be your first week, especially here in New York. Some of you might be going to in school, some of you might be doing remote, but especially for the little ones, I think a lot of elementary students, at least in our area, are going in person. I've got a couple special books for you. So Miss Bindegarden gets ready for kindergarten, and really this is dedicated to all of the wonderful teachers who work so hard to put their rooms together, and I know this year things are a lot different, but a lot of work goes into that. And then we have a book um, called Mr. Lincoln's Way about a really cool principal who really enjoys getting to know his students and finding that special thing about him. Then of course, here in the Catskills, it's apple picking time. I've made all kinds of yummy desserts already from our apples and hopefully we'll get some to make some cider in a few weeks. And then if we have time, we will do Pete Seeger's Abby Yo-Yo Returns. So, let's start with Miss Bindergarten Gets Ready for Kindergarten. And of course, the first night before school starts, every teacher has a hard time sleeping, right? <laughs> Not a lot of sleeping goes on. Miss Bindergarten Gets Ready for Kindergarten. It is the first day of kindergarten and oh, 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 Adam Krupp wakes up. Brenda Heath brushes her teeth. Christopher Beaker finds his sneaker. Miss Bindegarden gets ready for kindergarten. Oh, look, she's got all of her things on a cart and the room looks pretty empty with them, except for a lot of boxes and desks, right? Danny Hess rushes to dress. Emily Moko cools her cocoa. Fran Lister kisses her sister. Miss Bindergarten gets ready for kindergarten. She's putting away the books and setting up the play area. Gwen McGunny packs her bunny. Henry Fetter fights his sweater. Ian Lowe says, I won't go. Miss Bindergarten gets ready for kindergarten. Oh, she's sorting all of her blocks and she's setting up the art station. Jessie Syke pedals her bike. Kiki Wong hops along. Lenny Loom says vroom, vroom, vroom in his really cool wheelchair. Miss Bindergarten gets ready for kindergarten. She's setting up all the blocks and the letters. Maddie Lindo looks out the window. Noah Bond climbs right on. Ophelia Nye hugs goodbye. And Miss Bindergarten gets ready for kindergarten, setting up the growth chart up the mobiles. Patricia Packer sneaks a cracker. Quentin Wend high-fives his friend. Raffi Mack high-fives back. Sarah Von Hoff is the first one off. Miss Bindergarten is almost ready for kindergarten. She's putting on her lipstick now. Tommy Tuttle jumps a puddle. Vicki Denzel bites her pencil. Ursula Crew ties her shoe. Now Miss Bindegarden is all ready for kindergarten. Look at how nice her room looks. Except this year's rooms probably have some plexiglass and dividers and things like that. Wanda Chin marches in. Xavier Rowe yells hello. Yolanda Pound looks around. Zach Blair finds his chair. Good morning, kindergarten, says Mrs. Bindegarden. And oh, 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 the fun's big. Here's her class. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to read a book called Mr. Lincoln's Way by Patricia Palaccio. And let's see what Mr. Lincoln does. Let's see what kind of magic he can work. Mr. Lincoln was the coolest principal in the whole world, or so his students thought.
He had the coolest clothes, had the coolest smile, and did the coolest things. He had tea parties with Mrs. West's kindergarten every spring. He took Mr. Blish's sixth graders on nature walks in the fall. He set up his telescope next to the pond in back of the school on special nights and invited kids and their families to come and look at the stars. And in the winter, he was Santa for the Christmas play, lit the menorah for Shanika, wore a dashiki for Kwanzaa, and a burnous for Ramadan. Mr. Lincoln was just plain cool. Absolutely everybody thought so, except Eugene Esterhaus. Mean Jean is what everybody called him. Mean Jean sassed the teachers and beat up on most of the other kids in the playground. He was no student at all. He drove Mrs. Dunkel crazy in English. Mrs. Chu wanted to drop him from art, and he was a bully. He always seemed angry, picking on kids and calling them names. He's not a bad boy, really, Mr. Lincoln said, only troubled. To just about everybody in school, though, Eugene was troubled, spelled with a capital T. Then one day he leered at a first grader. What you looking at, scumball, he said, and he pushed her down and wrenched her backpack away. I'm going to tell Mr. Lincoln, she announced. Go ahead, you little brat. I ain't afraid of that. And then he stopped. Mr. Lincoln was standing right there. The bell rang and Eugene scurried away. Now Eugene was in Mr. Lincoln's thoughts more than ever. He knew he had to find a way to reach him. Then one day, as Mr. Lincoln was helping the fifth grade plant a tree in the beautiful new atrium, he noticed that Eugene was looking up in the branches of one of the other trees. There sat a bright red cardinal. Two other days, Mr. Lincoln had seen Eugene standing at the atrium window watching birds in the trees. Mr. Lincoln wondered, was it possible that it wasn't until a day later when Mr. Lincoln called Eugene into his office. Eugene slumped into a chair. Mr. Lincoln took a beautiful look out, a beautiful book out of his desk drawer, a book in blazing color and all about birds. He turned to one page and studied the illustration. I've got these little birds all over my tree and I don't know what they are. Eugene got out of his chair and walked closer. Those are red cap nut hatches. Weird to see them this time of year. You seem to know your birds, Mr. Lincoln said with a warm smile. I do. When I lived on my grandpa's farm, he had tons of birds around, chickens, thrashers, metal larks. We raised carrier pigeons together. You've got quite a grandpa, Mr. Lincoln said, but Eugene just turned his back on Mr. Lincoln and left the room. A week had gone by when Eugene ran into Mr. Lincoln by the atrium looking glum. I have a problem, Mr. Lincoln said. So? That atrium was supposed to be full of birds, but they're just not coming. The principal looked into the empty atrium. Wrong plants in there make them want to stay. Not the right food either, Eugene started to walk away. Your grandpa teach you that? Eugene turned and looked at Mr. Lincoln for the first time. Maybe. Do you suppose you could help us attract birds here to our atrium, Eugene? Mr. Lincoln handed him a book, and perhaps this would help? Eugene seemed stunned at first. Then he took the beautiful book on birds in his hands, wrapped it in his arms, and bolted down the hall. As the days passed, Eugene never seemed to be without his book. His English teacher let Eugene read passages from the book in class. I'm so pleased to see him reading, Mrs. Dunkel exclaimed. And when he didn't have his nose in that book, he was almost constantly out in the atrium. He and Mr. Lincoln made a list of plants and shrubs to buy and types of grain and seeds to feed the birds. They even built three feeders together. That's when it started to happen. The birds began to come. Nut hatches, bluebirds, a tanager, and many colored finches. So many different kinds that the whole school stood from time to time just to watch the wonder of them in the atrium. Eugene seemed genuinely happy. He didn't even tease the other kids anymore. Then one day, Mrs. Chu burst into Mr. Lincoln's office. There are two mallards nesting in the atrium. Mr. Lincoln rushed down to the hall, and sure enough, there in the atrium were a male and female mallard, and there was their nest in the southeast corner of the atrium. Mr. Lincoln saw Eugene on the other side of the atrium, giving him a thumbs up. I was hoping that they might be a mating pair, Eugene said one day as he and Mr. Lincoln looked at the five perfect eggs in the nest. Just one problem. The ducklings will need to be near water. They'll need to get to the pond outside. They can't fly out of the top like their parents. You'll think of something, Eugene. I know you will, Mr. Lincoln said, and he's put his hand on Eugene's shoulder. It was nice that mean Jean wasn't mean anymore. It was only three days later that there was a commotion in the hall. Miss, Mrs. Belding rushed into Mr. Lincoln's office with Eugene in tow. Mr. Lincoln looked at Eugene in disbelief. What happened? 
I'll let Eugene tell you, Mrs. Belden trumpeted. But Eugene said nothing. He just sat looking hateful and defiant. Trouble on the lunch line, she went on. He singled out two of our students from Mexico. He called them brown-skinned toads and other unacceptable names. I'll take care of this, Mr. Lincoln said quietly. Mr. Lincoln sat down in front of the boy. Eugene, my skin is brown too. Eugene just glared at Mr. Lincoln. This I know, Eugene. Someone who loves birds the way you do couldn't possibly have that kind of hate in his heart. Then Eugene began to cry. My old man got real mad when I got home late from helping you, he sobbed. He said, you're not our kind. Our kind, Mr. Lincoln murmured. He let, led Eugene to the window of the atrium. It was alive with the songs of the birds, icy sparrows, jays, cardinals, nuthatches, and the mallards. Don't all of those beautiful types and colors make this a beautiful place to be for all of them? Eugene nodded yes. Well, God made all of them, all kinds, just like he made all of us, Eugene. Fact is, all you children here, with all of your cool differences, are my little birds. Yes, my little birds, and that should be your answer as to what is right or wrong in what your father said, Mr. Lincoln said quietly. My old man calls you real bad names, Mr. Lincoln. He's got an ugly name for just about everybody that's different from us. Mr. Lincoln didn't talk for the longest time. Eugene, sometimes people get trapped in their thinking almost as surely as those ducklings will be trapped in that atrium, Mr. Lincoln said thoughtfully. My grandpa just wasn't like that. Mr. Lincoln put his arm around the boy's shoulder. I'd like to meet that grandpa, but Eugene, you have to promise me, even when bad things happen at home, here at school, you need to treat all of my little birds with kindness and respect. No more teasing and name calling. Please promise me. Eugene promised. Eugene was good to his word. He became a model citizen. He tried with all of his heart to keep his promise to Mr. Lincoln. Then one bright morning, Eugene stopped at the atrium window. The eggs were starting to hatch. He ran from room to room and brought the whole school to watch. The ducklings were hatching one by one. At first they were wet and unsteady, but in a short time they were fuzzy and racing about. As the days passed, the mallards flew out of the atrium, landing on the pond just behind the school. They were leaving their babies for longer and longer periods of time. Eugene and Mr. Lincoln knew that the time was approaching when they would need to get the ducklings out of the atrium and into the pond. They had a plan. When the big day arrived, classes were asked to stay in their rooms. Then Eugene and Mr. Lincoln opened the door to the atrium and stepped in. They had both practiced saying, ging, ging, like the mallard parents. Now they talked to the ducklings, coaxing them to follow. The father mallard waddled up to the doorway of the atrium and peered down the hall. At the end of the hall, the father mallard could see the lawn and the pond. Ging, ging, Eugene called. The mother mallard came out first, then one by one, her babies followed. Eugene walked down the hall, calling to them over and over as the family waddled behind him. Then all at once, the mother and father took the lead and the ducklings scurried after them. At the outside doorway, they stopped for a moment, and then the mother and father mallard jumped out of the doorway and coaxed each of the ducklings to follow. Mr. Lincoln and Eugene both stood and watched as the ducklings raced down the hillside and plopped into the pond with their parents. Now I know where the expression, like a duck takes to water, comes from, Mr. Lincoln laughed. You couldn't believe how well the babies swam. Parents had gathered at the top of the hill and they'd been invited to come watch from afar. Then Eugene heard a voice from behind them call out his name. Eugene, boy, over here. It was his grandfather. The boy raced up the hill. Mr. Lincoln joined them both. This is my grandpa, Eugene sang out. I know, Mr. Lincoln said. Eugene tur turned toward him. Had Mr. Lincoln had something to do with this miracle, with his grandpa being here? Now the old man shook Mr. Lincoln's hand heartily. I would sure like to stay with you again, Grandpa, Eugene said as his grandfather walked up the hill together. The old man put his arm around the boy's shoulders. We'll see, son. We'll sure see, he said. Later, Eugene and Mr. Lincoln walked down by the pond together. Eugene needed to say something to Mr. Lincoln. You showed those ducklings the way out, Eugene, Mr. Lincoln said. Hey, you showed me the way out, Mr. Lincoln, Eugene smiled. Then he stopped and looked into his principal's eyes. I'll make you proud of me, Mr. Lincoln. I promise. There's a lot of good messages in that book. And a good thing to remember that we have to listen to our hearts about what's right and wrong. And especially in today's world, 
I remember growing up in the 1970s and my dad would sometimes say really bad things about other people who were different than us. And in my heart, I knew that that wasn't the right thing. So I made sure when I grew up to always, always look inside of somebody instead of looking on the outside. So anyway, now it's time for Apple Picking Time uh, by Michelle Benoit Slauson. Some time after the summer is spent, but before the jack-o'-lanterns are lit, it's apple picking time. All over the valley, up and down the hillsides, the branches are heavy with red apples. Tomorrow we will go to work. When it's apple picking time, everyone has to help. The whole town knows we have only three weeks to get the fruit off the trees before it spoils. Papa takes time off from the market, Mama leaves the housework, and I don't have to go to school. Even the sisters from the convent help at harvest time. When you go apple picking, you have to get up before the sun. The moon is still high in the sky, and the rooster hasn't crowed yet. The birds are asleep. Everything is asleep except Mama, Papa, and me, and all of the other apple pickers. <laughs> We met outside the town in cars and pickups. Papa finds a place behind Grandma and Grandpa's truck. Then our families follow the narrow dirt road to the orchards. We travel past fallen corn stalks, fields of hay, and mailboxes with their flags up. If we hit a bump, the lights bounce from the road and we're in darkness again. Mama and Papa talk in low voices and I draw faces on the frosted window. We climb up the hillside and into the apples. We don't stop until we see the sign, Pickers Wanted. All of us kids jump out of the cars and pickups at once. The Hoffman twins are the first to swing from the low branches and we play hide and seek in the empty bins. It's easy to find each other because breath clouds tell your hiding space. Dave is our foreman and he arrives in a big truck that doesn't have a door. He hands each of us a purple ticket. Then Papa lifts up the lunch chest and we head down to our trees. Grandma and Grandpa are on the same row. I'm going to pick a whole bin, I say. That's a lot of apples, Papa answers. I'm bigger this year. No doubt about that, he says. While Papa sets up the ladders, Mama fastens the canvas bags around my neck, my back. It's not as heavy as last year, I say. There are no apples in it, Mama replies. But it's not loose either. No, it's not. I don't need to go over as many loops. You've grown. Even before Papa turns his radio on, I'm up the ladder. Twist, snap, twist, snap. The apples fall in the bag and rub against my stomach. I remember to lean into the ladder for balance so both hands are free for picking. That's what Grandpa taught me. We work fast in the morning because after lunch we will be hot and tired. Now we wear woolen shirts and gloves with the fingers cut out. Mama says when you go apple picking, you need to keep your hands warm but have a good grip. That's what Grandma taught her. Every few minutes, someone yells out, Fool! We hear Dave's tractor in the distance. First he stops for Sister Dolores, then Grandpa. Papa is next. Dave must have known Papa's bin was ready because he drives over while Papa is still up on the ladder. Before he takes the apples away, he punches a half moon on Papa's ticket. The tractor comes again and again, again and again. By lunchtime, Mama has two, and Papa has three half moons on their tickets. Mine has none. I help Papa spread out a worn quilt under a tree, and we make cushions with our heavy shirts. Mama unpacks the food and pours coffee for everyone but me. I have hot chocolate. Grandma always says that the food tastes better when you eat outdoors. I think so, too. Later, Papa fiddles with the radio buttons and the music changes. Ready, he asks. Papa, Mama takes Papa's hands, and he brings her to him almost in a hug, but more graceful. Then he twirls her around under the branches. Mama can spin good, even in tennis shoes. Round and round they go. When the music gets soft, Mama loosens her red scarf and brown curls fall down her back. Without stopping, they reach for me and we are three dancing. The music quickens and Papa carries me so I won't miss steps. We whirl faster and faster in a circle. As we spin, the trees do too and I'm sure they must be dizzy from watching us. The music slows and Papa sways back and forth with one arm around Mama and the other around me. I want the radio to play forever and our friends to keep clapping, but the whist work whistle blows and Grandpa calls to us. Even before Papa can turn the music low, I'm up the ladder. Twist, snap, twist, snap. That bin's almost full. 
We pick all afternoon and still the tractor doesn't come for me. Now the harness straps dig deep into my shoulders and the sun is too bright. Papa tries to move the ladder as the sun moves, but the sun always tricks him. Only the little kids napping under the trees have shade. Near quitting time, our row starts to empty. First Grandma and Grandpa pack up. Our friends follow soon after. When they go, their radios do too, and except for Dave's tractor in the distance, the orchard is suddenly silent. In the quiet, a girl's voice calls out full, and her echo answers right back. Mama, Papa, it's mine. But they are both already beside me. Congratulations, hooray for Anna. Mighty fine job, said Dave as he punches a half moon on my ticket. I guess you'll know what to do with this, he laughs. I don't take off my canvas bag and I don't wait for Mama and Papa. I run all the way to the orchard office to cash my ticket in. When Grandpa sees me, I get a big hug and all the other kids want to see the ticket too. Soon Mama and Papa join us and everyone loads up their cars and pickups and says goodbye. Then, in the procession, moves slowly down the hillside away from the apples. We travel past fallen corn stalks, fields of hay, and mailboxes with their flags down. And if we hit a bump, no one mentions it. Mama and Papa talk in low voices, and I dream about apples and dancing, and two half moons on a purple ticket. So, I think that's all we have time for today. So we'll have to save Addy Yo-Yo returns for next week. And I hope you have a wonderful week. And if it's your first week of school, no matter what that looks like, I hope you have a great week. And hopefully we'll all see each other in person soon. Take care. Bye-bye.